Hello and welcome everyone uh, to this last session of Open Glam Now, the Swedish National Heritage Board's webinar series on open cultural heritage collections and institutions by digital means. My name is Larissa Borg. I am working here at the Swedish National Heritage Board in the Department for Digital Dissemination. And I'm really glad that you joined today. So what we are going to talk about today is after open data. How do we become more open glam? And we're going to discuss questions as such, which role does open data play in making cultural heritage institutions more accessible? How and what do we have to change? And what processes do institutions need in their transformation? And how do we lead the way? Um, if you want to, um, you can also discuss topics like these um, with the hashtag OpenGlamNow on social media, for example on Twitter. And if you have questions, you can always turn there. We are going to talk today with Kaisa Hartig and Nils Dimmler. And Kaisa is the Head of Collections and Cultural Environment at the Westernorland County Museum here in Sweden. For 25 years, she has been working with digital development and strategic work within the cultural heritage sector. She's pro she has been project manager as the research, research project Collecting Social Photography, um, which some of you maybe uh, remember because we talked about it in the last session. Um, and uh, she has been um, also the co-founder of the nonprofit organization EDEC, um, which is delivering training programs for the nonprofit cultural and public se sector. So hi, Kaisa, and thanks for joining us today. Um, the other one um, is uh, Neil Stimler, um, and he's joining us today from New York. <laughs> so he stood up quite early for us. Thank you, Neil. And he's a senior advisor and business development specialist with the Balboa Park Online Collaborative. In this role, he advises clients to strategize programming, digital operations for exhibitions, and media partnerships for nonprofit institutions and technology initiatives that connect audiences to art, culture, and science. He's also a fellow at the Engelberg Center of Innovation Law and Policy at the New York University School of Law. And previously, he has also worked as the inaugural head of public en engagement at Auckland Art Gallery Toi o Tuamaki and at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in successive positions. So hi, Neil. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, we're starting with Kaisa's um, presentation. So hi, Kaisa, and thanks for joining us today. Let's start. So how do we become open glam is one of the titles of today's webinar. And my presentation is mainly about trying to frame what becoming open glam means for museums and also about looking at some of the challenges with this development. Uh, I'm not specifically an expert in open glam, uh, but I have a background, as Larissa mentioned, in the museum and archive sector, mostly focusing on photography collections and digital development of museums. And today I'm head of collections and cultural environments at the regional museum, Western Orleans Museum. I'm also the project manager of a research project collecting social photography, which uh, was presented at a previous webinar by my colleague Elisabeth Bog from the Stockholm County Museum. The project aims at producing recommendations for a collection of social digital photography, the photos that we take today with our smartphones. And I'll be shortly returning to the project a bit later in the presentation. So um, today's present presentation will be partly angled towards photography collections and also digital transformation in museums, as this is a topic of very much of interest for me. Uh, I'll start with a look back at 2010, where I encountered the Open Glam for the first time. Uh, I will talk a bit about licensing and open collections, how museums have approached licensing of especially photography collections. Uh, then have a look at where we are now, as I perceive it, how ready are museums for continuing to work with Open Glam. Uh, then, um, not broadening the definition of Open Glam, but rather the next steps of openness. And then I will end with uh, a summary. First of all, I'd like to take a look at the definition of Open Glam. And to prepare for this webinar, I'm sure you have discussed this also earlier at webinars, but let's just briefly look at the, the frames of Open Glam. The, the description of this webinar series is about open collections, free to use, but also about participation, being able to contribute. 
the term digital openness um, uh, is about access to cultural heritage. Uh, and I came across this, uh, the principles of Open Glam by the International Open Glam Working Group. And I realized it's, they were uh, written in 2013 and they are writing new ones in 2020. So they will probably change quite a bit. But uh, just to have a look at what is out there, um, the five rules heritage institutions are invited to follow are to release digital information about the artifacts, the metadata into the public domain using appropriate legal tools and keeping digital representations of works with copyright uh, for which copyright has expired in the public domain in by not adding new rights to them. And when publishing data, we need to make an explicit and robust statement of the wishes and expectations uh, with respect to reuse and repurposing. When publishing data, use open file formats which are machine readable. And the last one I find especially interesting, the um, opportunities to engage audience and audiences in novel ways on the web should be pursued. So uh, as I mentioned, the Open Glam Foundation are currently working on a new set of principles that will be released in 2020. And perhaps Larissa, you know more about these you could discuss after the presentations. So um, taking a look back, and this is of course from a Swedish perspective as this is the sector where I've been working in. Um, the current principles from 2013 are quite in line with early development in Sweden around open collections. And uh, discussions started here um, that I came across in late 2009 when Swedish Wikimedia Foundation started to put pressure on heritage organizations, many of which still published collections under full copyright. And at the time I was running the Swedish Secretariat of Photographic Collections and was approached by museums who discovered that their collections now were used in Wikipedia articles, so to speak, without their permission. <clears throat> there was a growing discussion on how to respond to this development that I felt needed framing from a broader perspective, not just the museum's perspective, but also to take the users in consideration. And this sounds today like an obvious thing to do, but 10 years ago, Swedish museums were still much influenced by the thought of photography collections as a source of income for photographers, for photographers and for the museums themselves. Uh, and there were, were a lot of discussions around copyright and nothing about Creative Commons yet at that stage. Um, so in 2020, 2010, I actually met Tim Wyatt, a Wikipedian at the yearly conference at museums and the web in Denver. Uh, so there, I, there, there was a session on Wikipedia and museums, and uh, we started to discuss the possibility of creating an event in Sweden where these issues could be discussed in a more contemporary way, so to speak. So um, we, I ended up organizing uh, a full day uh, workshop in collaboration with Wikimedia Sweden, <clears throat> and they were very happy to contribute and uh, to uh, engage in this day uh, with very short notice. So only two months later, we managed to gather 70 representatives from all the large archives, libraries, museums, institutions in Sweden. And this is actually a photo from that, <laughs> that day I, that I found online. Um, during this day, Wikipedians met with people from across the, the sector uh, to discuss Creative Commons licenses and find a way forward. And we had invited a representative also from the Swedish Creative Commons organization. And after this day, the Nordic Museum, where I was, I was working at the time, started to do some testing by releasing images from the photography collections under a Creative Commons license. And later, other museums followed with much larger, quanti larger quantities of collections being published on Wikimedia Commons. So what happened during the 10 years that has passed since this event, where, where were we then and where are we now? Uh, I think uh, definitely this was a first step to change mindsets in the museum sector. Museums started to realize the potential reaching out with their collections and also reporting back amazing statistics about the actual outreach. Uh, of course, on Wikipedia, uh, museums could reach a much larger audience with their collections than through their uh, collections websites, how now millions were viewing collections that previously 
had been hard to find and expensive to use also. And for various reasons, the development of open glam is, however, quite slow, I would say, in Sweden. And one thing is that many cultural history museums have collections that don't quite that they don't quite know how they can license under Creative Commons. And this is due to a very ambiguous uh, copyright law in the Nordic country, stating that works of art are protected 70 years after the photographer has passed away. And other types of photos, so-called images, are out of copyright only 50 years after the photo has been taken. So what is an image and what is a work of art in when you talk about photography? Uh, one definition states that uh, an image can be taken by two photographers separately and they end up with a similar result. But that is all we have to lean on. So it's quite difficult for um, staff to actually make the difference and to decide if this photo is um, free to use or not. Um, an internal report from 2011 at the National Heritage Board discusses the intention of this division claiming that the intention of writing the law would have been to give the pure art photography a special protection. And this would mean even though it's not written clearly in the report that, that all other photographs are images and free to use. Uh, four years later in another report from the Digistam Secretariat, there are some clarifications made referring to image manipulation, intentional composition, intentional use of light and shadow, intentional use of flash and lenses, etc. And this raises discussions today around, for example, very intentional use of Instagram, where all of these criteria could suggest that new works of art are produced. Uh, and my point here to bring this up is that if we were to ask custodians of photography collections, uh, which parts of their collections are free to use, many would still hesitate, unfortunately. And then I haven't even mentioned the GDPR issues. <laughs> Uh, I would also say that even though much more collections are licensed online with Creative Commons, we would get different reasons for releasing images under which license, under which license from different museums. So I think that's actually uh, a discussion that was vivid 10 years ago, but it needs to be brought up again. Yeah, and this is an example from Digital Museum, and that is a photo from the County Museum Gävleborg where they have decided to license this photo uh, with CC by share alike. Uh, and again, having common discussions around how to license, I think is still very uh, important. Um, so where are we now? Uh, going back to what's happened during these past 10 years, a lot has of course happened. And I think mainly art museums have done huge work by opening up their collections around the world. Uh, and in Sweden, we have the National Museum of Art sharing the collections with an open license. And the Royal Armoury uh, is another museum that have shared images online. But again, many museums still struggle with how to license images. Uh, and in these 10 years, museums funding for digitization has not increased. Previously, digitization has also been largely, largely dependent on employment measures, government funded projects for unemployed people. Uh, that since the second part of the 1990s have given temporary boosts of funding for digitization. But that means also that <clears throat> a lot of digitization that has been done in Sweden uh, was done perhaps 10 to 20 years ago or even more. And the quality of much that has been digitized is still not up to date with what we would need to satisfy users today and audiences the te technologies that can be used today. So there are several issues and obstacles and challenges. Um, and yeah, these are some factors that impact where museums are today in terms of open glam. There is still need for training and education around copyright and licenses. And I would say also that there is a need for education around the use of open collections to see further good examples of uh, how the collections can be used and understand the benefits for the museums. There is a need for discussions around what we should digitize and how to enable broad use. And there is certainly a need for discussion of priorities. What could Open Glam do for museums that struggle to remain relevant today? Because I, I do believe it's much, it's about so much more than licensing, and I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. Um, it's of course not a question again only about digitizing copyrighted photographs, but also about sharing images of objects in collections. And as I mentioned, these are some challenges, and. 
at the same time, the very positive development is that the role model projects that we've been hearing about during the webinar series, and uh, they show that not only can museums release collections free for anyone to use, but also that Open Glam can be of great benefit for all museums. Um, Open Glam is not only about large art museums with very homogenous visual content uh, collections that are digitized in high resolution, um, which are perhaps easier to build on than a smaller and uneven collection with various quality. But this is where I do look forward to the new principles of Open Glam that will be presented in 2020. Because I think broadening the discussions around what Open Glam is can also bring the benefits uh, into the discussion for smaller institutions. So uh, again, I don't know what these principles will look like, um, but here are some thoughts from me. Um, the, last the last of the five or six principles from 2013 was opportunities to engage audiences in a novel ways, in novel ways on the web should be pursued. And I think this is really the key to adopting Open Glam smaller institutions, how we work with outreach and how we engage audiences. Even though there are issues with licensing, that is not, it's still not, I, I think that's not the major challenge anymore, even though it's still there. Instead, it's about answering the question, what's in it for me? In what way do open museum collections benefit me? Uh, as a museum, how do we align the efforts with the museum's missions and goals so that we can actually achieve our goals thanks to Open Glam? What's in it for the developers? What thing can they gain by using your content? And what's in it for the end users, of course? What makes their day better by meeting, accessing, and using the museum's content through a third party developer? Having to answer these questions is very much in line with adopting new work practices generally in museums to continue to be relevant and discover new ways of engaging with and collaborating with audiences and partners. And this is a very good reason for making Open Glam an issue for the management to act upon. Um, so, yeah, that, that's the, um, the final of the, the, the six principles from 2013 uh, that I believe is really important and I hope will be elaborated on in the next version of the principles in 2020. So the next steps of openness, what comes next? I believe that the next steps of openness should focus on creating value for audiences. And in doing so, museums will also create a lot of value for themselves. And I think this means learning how to start conversations online, how to engage audiences online, and how to package the content so that it's seen as useful for target groups. Uh, I do anticipate and hope for smaller local regional institutions to become actors uh, around Open Glam. To get here, smaller museums need to understand the potential use of their collections long term. How can, for example, the regional government be interested in using collections in their work or local companies or nonprofits or the educational system? And how do we present collections in a way that is uh, useful for these target groups? I would love to see also collaborative projects across sectors here. And I think also regional governments would actually uh, be able to fund such projects. So um, perhaps that those are issues for the regional museums to, to look into in the, in the coming years. Uh, also, museums need to continue the dialogue of Open Glam and bring it into the management, as I mentioned before, as a key issue for museums to stay relevant today. And this is where it's important to show successful examples of other stories than from art museums, uh, how open collections can boost a community and make a difference in a local society. We need to keep sharing experiences of successful description of content, rich metadata that make collections searchable and usable. Uh, data quality is something I think museums, many museums notice and they know of, but they don't have a strategy um, as also because we're lacking resources. I would wish for workshops around improving metadata for collections so that they are relevant and useful for companies and others wishing to use the museum's API. Uh, another question to discuss is how can museums become a trusted content resource for developers and other users? Uh, and this is also where issues of ethics uh, needs to be discussed. 
But to get there, to build trust and to reach out, we need to learn how to start conversations online and to engage audiences. Uh, and again, I think this is key to the next steps of openness, along with openness in both directions, not only being to able to access collections, but to contribute to, to them, uh, as we have been discussing in the <clears throat> research project that I mentioned before, the Collecting Social Photo Project. Um, so in a way, we are here, uh, have the opportunity uh, under the term Open Glam to merge a lot of things in museums, both collecting and dissemination and also museum experiences. Um, so again, I think this is why I believe online collecting and, and open glam needs to be discussed and developed together in the museum sector. Uh, and of course, this means, as it always has, that we need to break the silos between collecting and dissemination, etc., and communication. To preparing for this webinar, I was looking around for current examples of museums taking a step forward around collections and came across this new collections interface. I'm sure Neil, you know very well this example. Uh, it's the M Plus Museum in Hong Kong. This builds on the principles of openness. And it's all about lowering thresholds and simplifying entry points, encouraging exploration of collections through continuous discovery. And it's also done by interlinking everything. So where if you start at some point, you can go on endlessly discovering and exploring, which is really exciting. Uh, if something here relates to something else, there is a link to get you there. That's what they describe this interface with. Um, the entire design on the collections website is there to give the user an understanding also of the collections, um, because that's another issue that we have. We present um, users with uh, an ocean of objects that are mostly very, very different and different quality, etc. And, and it's difficult to get a grip of that if you don't work with the collections firsthand. I just wanted also to show the web museum website of M Plus, and, and then that's also again <laughs> surprising and sparking curiosity, encouraging further exploration of the content. Um, but the point of showing this M Plus collections interface is also to remind ourselves that it's not just the actual licensing of collections that matters in Open Glam, but defining an open collection and also, of course, presenting it. So trying to summarize um, my thoughts on Open Glam, and it's very much uh, about thoughts, and I would like to have a conversation, of course, about this. Uh, I think it's good in Sweden to go back to the basic principles about open collections. Uh, there is still a lot of work to be done, but I think we are on the right track. Understanding is uh, there that the collections need to be usable and licensed at, as a first step. Many Swedish museums use digitaltmuseum.se and um, I think most collections there are actually licensed with uh, a Creative Commons license. But to bring Open Glam to a much more solid foundation in the museum sector, it needs to be, again, a topic for the management. <clears throat> the role of open data in making cultural heritage institutions more accessible is central in the sense that it does support both civic society, nonprofits, and local companies uh, to develop and thrive. From my point of view at Western Orleans Museum, I see so many different uses of our collections, and it's easy to imagine a much wider use if our collections were not only free to use, but also searchable with rich metadata and available in high resolution. And again, if the collections were comprehensible, not just an ocean of images and objects. So I think we have a lot of work to do here, and uh, I hope uh, it could be also an issue that the regional museums could, could um, discuss in the years to come. So um, again, I think it's very uh, much about engaging audiences, not just online, but also in gallery, in the museum, uh, about understanding online audiences, about starting conversations online, and of course, raising general digital competence in museums. Uh, and now we are also looking at public facing activities. Uh, this encourages us to look at collections as central in the role of museums as arenas for public dialogue, for engagement around, for example, a sustainable future, 
around the topic of democracy, etc. So what I'm trying to say here is that once we acknowledge the role of collections as central in museums, engagement of audiences, which is something that has been discussed for decades in the museum sector, and perhaps perhaps even more so in the last decade, then the question of open glam and how we define open glam becomes relevant on a whole different level. We move from focusing on licensing and technical solutions to the role of collections as a public interface, uh, not just uh, an interface online, but actually arena or tool for participation. Uh, we have a Swedish researcher, Eva Silvian, who wrote uh, in 2010, actually, about and not uh, actually talking about digital collections, but about collections in general. I think it's very suitable here. She talked about collections as a public interface, a channel whereby a museum can communicate with its users and become an arena where they meet in a joint quest for knowledge and multifaceted understandings. So um, this is where I would say museums are facing challenges with Open Glamour, the repurposing of collections as a foundation for audience engagement, collaboration and participation. And a few specific areas are building trust. How do we create arenas that are trustworthy spaces for large topics such as sustainability, climate change and democracy, and also for sensitive and difficult topics? How do we pursue online dialogue around these topics? Um, engaging audiences using inclusive methods, how do we succeed in engaging successfully in dialogue with and participation? And keeping up with rapid changes, adopting new methods for engaging audiences, but also disseminating and collecting online requires constant monitoring and adoption of new work methods. And how can museums keep up with that? Um, and rapid changes require agile work methods. How can museum learn and adopt new work methods? Uh, and as I mentioned before, cross collaboration, I think is really a prerequisite as we bring together um, not only um, a very small fraction of dealing with collections and licensing, but bringing collections uh, as open and usable as arenas for conversation. Um, that means that we need to work um, across departments uh, across departments in in museums and that requires also uh, again adopting a new mindset we have adopted a new new mindset once we learned that we needed to license our content and collections but now we need to take the next steps and i think that uh, this is something i would really like to hear your thoughts on also both neil and Lar larissa um, that was about it from me. Thank you very much, Kaisa, uh, for this great presentation. Um, I really liked your thoughts, especially on these three points of um, communication within the, the institution. So breaking the silos and um, actually taking uh, this discussion to the management and uh, the wider institution and also to, um, to actually showcase what is there in the sector when we don't look at art museums. So when we look at the small museums, when we look at everyday life uh, histories, museums and uh, so on. So um, thank you very much for this first presentation. Um, so I think it's time for Neil. Hello, everyone. Uh, greetings from New York. So I'm really excited to be here. And what I'm presenting today is called the Open Access Method. So uh, many of you may know that I was involved in the design and implementation of the Metropolitan Museum of Art's Open Access Initiative and also the Cleveland Museum of Art uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. So this is an opportunity for me to share the learnings that I provided from those experiences and also the work that I'm currently engaging other clients. So the first half of the presentation is going to speak very practically about what it takes to do an open access launch and the requirements of that process. And then I'll speak about the programming elements that can happen after launch. And so where do we begin? So first of all, open access is about digital transformation. So the importance of that position is that your organization needs to take certain steps in order to be able to do an open access initiative. It needs to have a core set of technical requirements, staffing in place, policy work done as well. So open access is also a baseline requirement for a cultural institution today. It's not a nice to have, it's not we'll get to it someday, it's not maybe we'll do it. It's a baseline requirement for any cultural organization, whether your focus is art, history, or science. 
a key point to know as well is that open access is a program and not a project. So many museum digitization projects have been left stalled or failed or discarded over time, especially in the digital space, whether those were experiential or collections research-based. This is a fundamental change for an organization. Open access is something that once you've committed to doing it, you continue to do it for the future. So it's important when you're working through this change that you help your organization see that journey. It's mission critical. There's nothing more important in terms of connecting your mission to your public than open access. It is, if you look at many of our mission statements at cultural organizations around the world, we talk about access and service and discovery. This is the most important thing you can connect your organization to do. And open access enables future readiness. So the key too is engaging in sustainability, the sustainability of our relationship with cultural heritage uh, through digital technology. It's also an opportunity for revenue generation and engagement opportunities that weren't possible with the restrictions of, of the copyright procedures and our working processes. Now I want to talk about the, the makeup of a project team, uh, the project team that leads through the process of transformation and open access. So first you start with your attorneys. Uh, if you have an in-house attorney, uh, they're going to be a key stakeholder in making, helping you make decisions and guiding you through the process. You might also have external counsel, so other legal experts and areas of expertise that you want to bring in that can support the work that you're doing. Your board, so in the case of both uh, the institutions that I've worked with in the United States and abroad, having the support of your board, whether that's governmental or a private board, is critically important. And your director and your executive leadership team and their, their support being on the project initiative is hugely important. And then in terms of actually guiding it through, you'll need a project manager and a project coordinator. So a project manager is the person who's responsible for the, the overall leadership of the project, driving that open access launch through the method, and making sure people stay focused and on task. And a project coordinator is someone, their role is more as to do administrative work, scheduling support, keeping communication open. So two different roles, but important roles. And then you'll likely have collaborators across your areas of practice within an institution. So your collections managers, your rights and reproductions managers, your technical developers, then you'll have leadership from each of those practical areas as well. And then your partners. And it's important to think of your partners in very generous terms. So I think institutions sometimes struggle by thinking about themselves first and foremost, but in terms of their communication about open access. But when you're working with partners, they're part of your team. And so it's important to treat them as team members and collaborators. So now I'm going to go through the basic structure of open access launch and talk about the core process and product areas. It's things that you have to deal with as you're going on the journey. So the first is your rights and reproductions and your legal tools. Uh, I strongly favor the use of Creative Commons Zero public domain dedication for several reasons. One is it is the most uh, open of the CC tools, legal tools. It does not have a requirement of attribution, and it does also not require someone to share under the same terms. And this is important, I believe, from the perspective of liberty and also from the perspective of reuse. Uh, many people may not want to be constrained by the terms of share like. And you also necessarily may not want attribution in all circumstances. We also have to think about the opportunity in the present and the future for artificial intelligence and machines uh, taking stacks of museum data and media assets and moving them without that process of human intervention. So it needs to be on the human, it needs to be on the human and the machine readable legal deed itself to guide that use. So for the greatest openness, I recommend Creative Commons Zero Public Domain Dedication. And of course, this is also contingent upon the laws in your country uh, and what you can do there. Policies you'll need to address. So your website now, your museum collection likely has a whole page of policy statements. You'll have to reflect them in terms of responding to open access. You also may have to change your policies on site in the physical building of your museum or institution in response to this as well. For example, if you have a researcher policy that someone comes to your collection storage, you may have to update that, that policy that allows them to take pictures or not take pictures. In the case of the Cleveland Museum of Art, uh, when you if you go to the Cleveland Museum of Art in Ohio, you can take a picture of any public domain work of art, and you are free to reuse that picture without asking for permission from the museum. So the public domain is also physically part of the environment that you can experience in a museum. You'll need to update your request process. So this means your form submissions, your policies around how you fulfill uh, order of requests for images, and your terms of use. So that thing is the policy statement that governs the use of your collections and your content. Another important area is 
cultural and community responsibility. So you may be working with a certain collection that has an important community of practice or a different identity or expression or heritage that matters to them and it matters to you as a museum steward. So it's important to think through about the implications of your collections and your data, your relationships with your constituents and stakeholders, and how to manage those effectively uh, for the best possible outcome for your constituents and for the public at large. And so you'll have to make changes in your policy. You want to identify a value statement that speaks to the intentionality of that relationship and the work you're going to do together. Then also making sure that moving beyond the value statement, you work into actually making fundamental changes to collections management systems and to your publishing processes and your programs. So if you are working with the community, making sure that you're actually instilling into your databases those changes, working with community relationships, and making sure that the data is visible as they would like to do so in partnership with you or not. Next piece is, um, again, systems and support. Very important, the backbones are making sure your collections management system has uh, unique identifiers, that it can publish to the web, that it can export data, that you have a data asset management system that is connected to managing media and image assets, that your assets are of good quality and are in a ready state to be shared, that your metadata is, is clean and consistent as best it can be, and that uh, you're being as permissive as you can be with your metadata, especially um, in the example of provenance or the history of ownership of an object. This is an important area, but also descriptive text. So many museums have made tombstone or identifying information around their collections available, but not the things that actually give context to those collections, which is why the, the metadata is so important. And also updating your websites your GitHub repositories where people store the metadata themselves or the code base for their application programming interfaces and making sure that your servers are in good shape. Speaking to customer service and open access is part of customer service in terms of what we experienced in support of our patrons and our colleagues is that we need to improve uh, our inquiry methods of how people contact the museum, how we communicate with them. Uh, and improving and updating fulfillment services. And by fulfillment, I mean the process by which someone requests from the museum media assets or data. So in the past in the United States, many museums charged usage fees. For example, they would charge a fee to use an image on a cover of a book or to use it in an advertising campaign. So once you go open access, it isn't really appropriate to charge usage fees anymore because that goes counter to the mission and the ethos of what you're doing. It is, it is possible to charge for digitization and service fees. Uh, this is a cost, right? It costs people time and money to do this work. It's, it's something that it's an expense and it's a service that's provided. So these are reasonable things to charge money for. And then you also have the opportunity to refresh licensing partners. So in the United States, but also in Europe, uh, many institutions partner with licensing agencies who act on their behalf to fulfill requests. You'll need to renegotiate those relationships and update your policies. Next is marketing and communications. So working with your communications and your marketing team to really help understand how important this initiative is and what it means. So one thing I often say, well, open access is the most important thing your organization will do more than any building, event, exhibition, project, or publication. So while your museum may have an exhibition or a project it loves and goes back to and refers to in its institutional culture, you only go through the open access process on a fundamental level one time. And it's the most impactful thing your organization can do, at least in our time, in our moment. What happens after that, we have to see. But there's nothing that has come before that will ever mean or have as much impact as this. Also to note that open access serves to support cosmopolitanism in a global community. So oftentimes I think we focus, we tend to focus on our regional or our local or our national initiatives, but it's important to remember that open access is about engaging a global community and sharing and participating with a global community like I'm doing with you all today, which is so wonderful and important to building our relationships across the sector and with our publics. And it's essential to sustainability and public engagement. So keep, you need content, your institution needs content to share and communicate and dialogue with audience. If your content's restricted, you can't build a sustainable relationship and engagement with your public. And again, going back to that importance of mission. Next, just I'll run through very quickly here the digital content pieces that you need to, to examine when you're preparing for open access. Analytics and dashboards, incredibly important. So many times we get excited about going open access, we do all the technical work, but we don't actually have the reporting to demonstrate the impact and to measure that and to show that back to our boards, to show that back to our public. And sometimes museums can be afraid to share that impact 
publicly. And so I, I encourage museums to use public dashboards to show the impact of open access, because one of the questions that we still deal with is, well, is this valuable? Is this helpful to people? Does this make our institution better? So we need to put our analytics where our statements are and demonstrate that impact and value. And then also to understand that if you have, for example, your organization has a application, uh, whether that's for the, the on-site visitor experience or a digital content experience, you need to bring open access to that space. You'll have statements in form for blog posts about the mission for your institution. You'll need to cover your frequently asked questions to help guide your users through the content. The in the news uh, section is very important as well. A lot of museums make this mistake too. They have an open access launch, they have a very exciting reaction in the press, and then they don't actually consolidate and present back to the public the information and the impact of that, of that press experience. And so as time goes on, it's harder for the museum staff and the public to find out what was the impact of this, what was the historical context. Working with your partners is again key. Uh, you'll have to have a big social media campaign, updating your websites, and it's also very helpful to have very good video pieces as well. So a video piece that can succinctly describe the ethos of your mission, why you're doing this, but also just go through this, those basic technical changes. Collaborations and partnerships, another key aspect as well. So who can you work with to magnify your impact? Uh, you can work with artists, you can work with educators, you can work with donors and funders, you can work with content distribution platforms, and you can work with and should work with commercial partners. And then in the United States, we often think about the impacts of this for, as I mentioned before, new revenue and business generation. And one of the things that people say is, well, if I can't license images anymore, how do I make revenue? Well, as Kasia already mentioned, and there's been so many important papers and reports on this fact of the lost image licensing revenue by Simon Tanner, by uh, Ken Cruz, uh, Diane Zorich has mentioned this work as well. Moretta Zanderhoff has spoken about this a great deal. The shift in the value for working with a cultural institution is to optimize the brand trademark. The relationship that you have with your institutional brand and the people that you want to partner with. So it's finding the right corporations, the right independent makers. So you, may, you might think about the Rikes Museum example of the, the Etsy marketplace of maker communities, but also technology startups. And then the components of the launch, uh, the launch event itself. It's important to understand that a launch event with open access, the primary audience for that is the internet. So while it may be people that are physically in your space, which is an important component, as again, going back to the fact that open access is a global community, don't forget to turn on the internet when you have a launch event. <laughs> Another key example too is you want to show the generosity of your partnerships and have people with you on site and at your launch that demonstrate the impact and the potential of your open access release. And then your press release and your press campaign are really important to do in a thoughtful and nuanced way so that you can inform uh, journalists and, and writers and bloggers across the sector on the importance of this initiative. And just my little bullet point at the bottom there is it launches the beginning, not the end. So the launch is not the end of your open access campaign. It's just, it's just that you might as well think about it as day one. And now I want to talk about what happens after you open access to your collections and how do you actually develop the sustainable program and moving it from a launch project to a program. And this actually means rethinking what museums do. It means changing the products and services that we make to adapt to this new environment. So a first way of, of making the, the experience better is to improve the quality of collections data and media, which I mentioned. And so a key way of doing this is providing alt, alt tags, verbal descriptions for people that are blind and low vision, but also these things benefit all users. Um, supporting translation. So now that your collections data is open, if you have a country where there's multiple languages or you have audiences from your analytics that show that you have multiple language speakers, take the time to invest in translation, either through crowdsourcing or through paid services, so that your content has more value and more impact. Also transcription. Uh, many museums have documents or have objects that act like documents, like rare books or archival, archival materials. We need the data to make those assets useful to people so they can be found by change, so they can be covered and interpreted and parched. And then one of the other elements too is user-generated content, starting to, as Kasha mentioned too, bring that relationship back into the systems, the core systems. And so as I was speaking before about community relationships, that means you have to work with your attorneys and your, your policy workers on what it actually means to bring that data into a system and how you will steward it and then start writing the policy. And then again, another thing that museums aren't used to doing, soliciting user feedback. So through email lists or through social media conversations or online surveys, asking for feedback, asking for ways to improve the experience. Um, it's not something that you just turn on the faucet and let the water run. You have to make sure that people are paying attention to these things. The ethos of the program development, so the sort of the energy, the spirit behind it. 
it needs to have an energy of entrepreneurship. You're going out and you're creating something new. You have to have a, a drive and an interest and a focus to take this to the next level. Entrepreneurship. This is something that means that within your own organization, you can take an entrepreneurial mindset and apply the tactics of innovation. Again, this is part of an international exchange. So it's not just about you. It's not just about your local community. It's part of the global community. And you have to be open to the idea of engaging in that the content and the collections you're producing now are part of a free market. They're part of a process of exchange. And you are now more aggressively competing for people's time and attention. So the content that you make yourself and with partnerships competes in that landscape. And what should your organization make now that you have this open data? What should you actually make and put out in the world? So from a digital products and services standpoint, you can think about engaging artificial intelligence, uh, both for improving your own collection data, but also for connecting to larger services and products. You can have events. Uh, so an event that's related to open access would be, for example, a Wikimedia Edit-a-thon. Right now that your collection is available, you could host local Wikimedia and online participation to build that engagement on the platform. You can highlight your collections and your open access content in an exhibition, right? So an exhibition is something that museums are very used to making. We know how to do it very well, but have you actually brought open access through your label text, through your programming, through your content into that space? Your mixed reality experiences, your AR and VR, so putting those assets back out into the world or in your physical museum on site through mobile application. Public programs, too, have discussions with people about open access, right? So it's not just about reading the policy on the website, but it's about convening people with your institution to actually discuss this. And it's not just for the, the folks like us that are watching the webinar today who are talking about this in a policy context, but for the public, so they understand the importance and value of this. And your streaming services in your in your podcast and your video. So if you're producing content around open access, you could also choose to openly license the very content you're producing. So part of it's actually changing the way we make the content uh, as EM creators. And the same is true of using social media engagement and also video on demand. So many of you may be familiar with people's opportunity to watch exhibition encapsulations on streaming services or having seen them in a movie theater. So if your institution is making uh, videos about your exhibitions, can you open license that? Can you construct it in such a way that you can do that and share that online so its impact is extended? And then video games. Uh, video games and esports are among the most attracted uh, points of entertainment and engagement in the world today. There are millions of people that play video games. And so if you can engage users with your content by partnering with gaming companies, by sharing your assets, if you have 3D media assets like 3D models with gaming companies, you might actually see your a helmet from your armor collection in a video game. And what could that do to draw attention to your collection and to your institution if you have the right partnership strategy? Also want to focus on learning. Uh, so in the United States, we talk a great deal about STEAM and STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and math. We also add A for art uh, to make sure that art stays in the picture as well. Uh, but many museums, whether they're an art museum or a history museum or a science museum, can actually overlap and cover both of those very well because there are aspects to scientific research and conservation of your collection regardless of what it is that can address both of those areas as well. There's still a growing development of a massive open online course structure, so if you're developing online courses either for professional audiences or for learners, you can use your open access content there. One of the things I often would advise education departments around is curriculum alignment. So this is a shift for museums, I would say in the United States, but it could also be true in Europe and elsewhere. Museums historically and education departments have created their own content about exhibitions for their own purposes. But with, with funding structures, whether it's from private money or government, I believe it's increasingly important to make sure that the education content we create is aligned with curriculum standards in, in your region, to make sure that you're aligned with teachers, so you're working with people that are in the school system, and you're also focusing on student-centered learning. So education shifts from being about the museum telling the public to the museum working with educators, the public, and curriculum creators. There's also a big opportunity with open educational resources to openly license these as well. So most museums that I'm aware of today don't actually openly license their lessons plans. They just put up a PDF on the website and don't have any licensing information. So teachers can't actually remix those and reuse them in helpful ways. So again, this is about working with teachers. Online learning platforms, there's many encyclopedias, of course, Wikipedia being one. Uh, there's data repositories, uh, and your data and your media assets, the way that they can be used and packaged by teachers is important. So when I first started working at the Metropolitan, we used to distribute slides, 35 millimeter slides uh, to teachers, but now you're going to be using data and media assets to do that. You can also support open textbook initiatives, which are hugely beneficial to students. So rather than a student having to buy an expensive textbook, which may be several hundred dollars in the United States, 
and then it's all about applications. Most of our exhibition catalogs, as far as I know, unless someone's using a printing press, are made with digital tools. And they're made from Word documents, Word processing documents. So you could make fully available open access version of your publication uh, as a, of a scholarly monograph with open license. So looking at the area of museum publications even further, so most conservation research, uh, your exhibition catalogs, scientific research papers, symposium proceedings, and special publications. Taking that publishing arm within an institution, whether it's in a partnership with the university press or an internal publisher, and bringing that to new opportunities with publication is very important. And then if we go to commissions, uh, many museums work in partnership with individual creators. They commission new artworks, they creation, cr commission new code, new research, work for hire. And these new products that take museum collections should be made openly available when they can. And then we'll talk about uh, partnerships. And this is an important area as well I mentioned. So I've just given you some examples of the types of organizations that you can work with in each of these areas. Uh, so the licensing areas there are, are, are known players. A technology, I've worked with a constellation of different groups between uh, Google, Microsoft, Sketchfab, Artsy is one we also enjoy in the United States. Uh, you have your academic databases and research hubs. So some some that I have worked with in the past and know of would be Art Store and JSTOR from Ithaca, and Oxford Art Online also has open access components. And then of course your key partners too are open access partners. Again, I mentioned Creative Commons before, Internet Archive, Wikimedia, and Europeana for you all, of course, uh, working in Europe as well. And uh, we find in the United States too, we love working with Europeana through the efforts they have with Europeana Pro and the efforts they have with Douglas McCarthy to constantly communicate about the positive impact. And so we also love working in the States. And then the last concluding point that I wanna make is that open access is about the commons of now. It's a living, vibrant, and vital commons. And cultural organizations can create content and dedicate it to the public domain today. We don't have to wait another 100 years or whatever the term of copyright is in your country. We can do it today. Um, and so this is, I think, another shift in mind in that open access tends to be thought of as only historical content that's already in the public domain. But it's also our responsibility as cultural institutions to make a vital public domain by making content that is uh, using Creative Commons tools like CC0 or CC BY now. So if we think about the scale and the change that's happening with these important technology trends around us, artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, and just maybe even devices that you already have in your home, if you have a, a Google Assistant or an Alexa, uh, you're already communicating with, with machines and software that are built entirely on the open web. They're built on Wikipedia. They're built on open data sets. And if you want your culture to be accessed and shared and engaged with by people, well, simply from their, their smartwatch or from their home, uh, you need to be participating in that and finding the right ways to do that. So that's that's my uh, presentation today. I'm happy to take any questions and and help anyone explore those options further. But uh, don't forget, it's the commons of now. And thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. That was a really interesting uh, presentation. And it was so much input. So I think I have to go through it again um, to actually get all your points. But I think that what was really interesting, especially that was um, that you have so many common points, Kaisa and Neil, um, when we're talking about um, community and outreach. So maybe we start with a question uh, to uh, you, Neil, uh, to and you, Kaiser Neil can and join Kaiser. in. Uh, so um, you said that open access is part of um, customer service, actually. Um, can you maybe elaborate um, more um, about what you actually think is the future of um, building communities when we talk about open glam? Absolutely. So part of what the relationship talking about is an open relationship from a closed relationship for a museum. Museums in the closed scenario only provided information in a one-way direction. Here's the information for you. And so when I speak about customer service, it means we also have to build technically input methods and then be ready to go through the process of dialogue. So on the technical side, it means having ways for, and I actually mentioned this in my museums in the web paper that was published earlier this year too, is to have through our websites and through our collections databases, ways for user-generated comments to come back into our system for evaluation and discussion. Now, this was something that has happened in the past. It's not a new idea. Uh, the Brooklyn Museum, for example, used to have public comments on its collections website. So we've experimented with this before, but we also need to re-engage it now with the more sophisticated tools and the changing nature of things that we have. And then in terms of further response to customer service, if, if we hear from our public and our customers that they're having a hard time finding what they need, securing the images they need, using the data. Rather than having a person send an email that gets passed around an organization for weeks on end, 
it's being responsive to that. So one of the ways of doing that in a customer service area is to actually have a titting system, much like a technical help desk. Uh, if you have a technical support question that you can actually follow and track those technical support requests and help people solve their problem, just like any other good business would do. And this is, I think, an important area as well is that museum museums are businesses. We may have social goals, but we also have to be responsible to the experiences of our patrons and our customers and treat them well. So that's the technical side. In terms of the community engagement, it's a shift in focus of how we do that. So rather than it just being a physical on-site invitation to come to the museum or for a tour or for a conversation, it's also using the tools of open access to go out into the communities and work with teachers, to go out into communities and work with those communities using the tools of the data and the media assets. So that's a new method for education and outreach that requires some training and upscaling for many people. They need to learn how to use these tools. They need to know how to understand data and images and how to use software that comes up with most basic PCs, but also some more advanced technologies. So uh, talking about corporations, Kaiser, you mentioned um, in your presentation the idea of working together with, for example, local governments. Can you explain that a little bit further? Um, it's nothing that we have tried yet, but we have, I mean, if we go back to the museum's goals, uh, there are a lot of things that align with Open Glam. We are supposed to be an arena for um, discussions uh, and meetings in society, in the local society, where people can meet and also discuss current issues around sustainability, etc. Uh, so, so that's why I believe that bringing the collections into such collaborations uh, would be very much a benefit both for the museums filling, up, filling their goals, but also for for uh, not just the local governments, but also local companies and schools, etc., and uh, non-profit organizations, because we are also uh, the museum, the country museums are there for all these actors in society and to bring them together and to create something uh, that is beneficial for the, the growth of the region is something that I know um, would I think it would be possible to find funding for. So that's why um, I agree with you, Larissa. All, and thank you, Neil, for all the... It's like a handbook of Open Glam you've <laughs> served us today. Uh, and I think f for many smaller mediums, you, you need to kind of start somewhere, take the first step. And and uh, also, uh, as you said, Neil, we should wait, we should do it now. And that that's where I think bringing in collaborating partners and meeting the goals, the overall goals of the museums using Open Glam would be great. Exactly. And I think especially this aspect of network building that you mentioned is really crucial to Open Glam. Okay, um, the next question to you two comes from the audience. And I read to you the question from one of the participants. I have several examples from Germany where smaller institutions don't really succeed in getting a start in getting objects digitized, including metadata in a usable format. The hurdle to contact an aggregator and get things done is sometimes too big. Are there examples of smaller institutions having succeeded and why they had success? Was that a matter of money or funding, personal contacts, etc.? Yes. So one of the most important examples of open access in the United States was the Walters Art Museum, which is in Baltimore. And that at the time was led by their very notable director, Gary Vicon, and the team there. And they just decided as an, as an institution that open access was a priority. And so they raised the funds, they put the, the process in motion, and they digitized their collection. They made it openly available. Uh, Will Knoll, who is now at the University of Pennsylvania, was also a very important figure there. You may know Will's very famous TED Talk about the Archimedes Palimpsest. And that was an important example of open access, whether your institution is small, medium, or large, whether it's art or history or science. It's about prioritization. And that's why I talk about digital transformation. If your board, if your director, if your leadership wants to do it, you can do it, and you can find the money. It also means that sometimes you may have to stop doing some things you're doing now in order to reprioritize it. So, for example, if you're spending money making printed, printed color, full color brochures for your exhibitions that get thrown to the ground, stop doing that and invest in open access. If you're making giant posters that you throw in the garbage, stop doing that and invest in open access. If you are having expensive events where most of the food is thrown to garbage, think about that and invest in open access. So it's about the priority and the choice. It can be done.
Uh, yeah, I think uh, it's about a change of mindset, first of all. Uh, uh, having that, of course, I think most museums need those ambassadors and, and uh, early adopters to take the first step, but also uh, to get it approved by management. It needs to be uh, a small experiment to start with so that it doesn't cost that much or it's not taking too much resources. And then, uh, as Neil talked about earlier, being able to tell the story of success to uh, show the... <laughs> The statistics of how many people watch the um, the collections on Wikipedia, etc. Or if you bring it into a collaborative project with the um, local nonprofits, etc. How much uh, of the collections were used and in what way, etc. Just to tell the stories of success. So I, I do like changing mindsets uh, and taking small steps, finding what the very first step of your organization is. Um, the best to take, um, not being uh, uh, overwhelmed by everything at once, because I think we are still very much in a phase where museums, um, you know, it, it's a slow change, but we, we are getting there. But um, for a small first step is what I would say. Sometimes I find that when I'm talking to museum clients, they are always searching for the perfect example that matches their institutional story, well, the news is you're not necessarily going to find one. So you have to be able to take it on yourself as an organization to commit to the task and go forward. You may not find the perfect scenario or the perfect compliment that you can show to your board. So you have to make the case of why it's important to do it on its own merits. Okay, right. Uh, so now we have another question from the audience. With two people and practically no funds, can I have the three most important steps, please? <laughs> Kaisa, what would you say? Uh, um, I, again, uh, I think find a topic uh, that you would like to work with. Uh, if you're even a small nonprofit organization uh, or a very, very small museum, if you are... Um, want to bring up something that is connected to an upcoming exhibition or a project, just take a, a limited amount of digitized objects or, or if it's they're not digitized yet, it's, I mean, digitizing 20 photos or whatever, it's something you can do quite easily. And just sit down together with collaborating partners and discuss um, what met metadata should be added for them to be of value and uh, discuss with collaborating partners, how they would use to want to use these uh, pieces of collection. And maybe they would like to print postcards or they would like to um, use them in a book or whatever. But yeah, one topic, <laughs> limited amount of uh, uh, content. Uh, and again, small experiment, short, maybe work in a couple of weeks and then um, evaluate what you've been doing. I think those were three steps. <laughs> so I would say start with data. If you're looking for the, the things that you can lift first and lighter, start with your data. Uh, image rights and media assets can be harder for an organization depending on what their collection type is. If you have a lot of uh, collection records that haven't been evaluated yet for copyright issues or for other policy issues, you can start with working within the realm of what I would again call tombstone data, the basic identification of what's in your collection and then doing work to improve the value of that data and sharing it out. So, uh, for example, there are museums in the United States that uh, have restrictions like the Museum of Modern Art because of copyright restrictions and other restrictions can't make available many of its images, but it does and has its data. So start with data, I would say, if you're looking for a first step. And then uh, two-dimensional images are your next step, hopefully TIFFs and JPEGs using those open formats and standards. And then when you're ready to graduate to three-dimensional objects and do some scanning, you can do that as well. So. Start with data, 2D images, and 3D images on the asset classes. And if you have a collection that you feel is of content value, but also in an open arena, then focus on that content example. So some, sometimes people say, I want to start open access, and they may choose a very arcane, research-oriented collection that, to a general audience, is not appealing. So make sure that you choose something that is appealing to a broader public beyond just one small set of co a community. I would actually add something um, because I think, especially if you are new to the the idea of open glam, the most important thing is actually 
um, get help. Um, there is uh, a lot of, this is one community where you really um, find people who want to help and who want to support you. And um, so my three steps would actually be to get on Twitter, follow the relevant hashtags if you don't uh, do until now, um, get to know the right people, um, join the Europeana network, for example. It's a free network um, of professionals in the digital cultural heritage sector. Um, and there are, is loads of work going on and help um, in you, the questions you have. Um, and then don't um, start with building things, actually, but find uh, and identify the things that are already on the market free to use. For example, as you two also mentioned, Wikimedia Commons. So you don't even have to have, a, for example, collect man management system to actually be, be, become visible on uh, Wikidata or Wikimedia Commons. Um, but uh, coming to the next question, um, you both also mentioned um, sustainability of projects. And uh, I think that uh, what is really interesting is that um, when we talk about funding and projects, there is often a risk of actually having uh, project funding and being really successful for some time. Um, but then um, as the project ends and the funding ends people have to leave their uh, place they uh, the knowledge when uh, goes with them and that's a problem um, so when we talk about the future of open glam how do you also think um, the work around open glam has to change again i think start very small and bring it into the regular work of the museum um, don't make separate projects you can have separate projects if you have a, a big amount of funding that you know will last if you want to uh, push out your entire collection online. But uh, to get, I think as digital transformation in museums today is mostly or more about uh, mindsets than technology. It's about, I think that, like Neil said, there are so many ways to bring in the uh, open access mindset into everything we do. and. Uh, and that means that bringing on board all the colleagues uh, that produce texts for exhibitions or pamphlets or whatever, uh, how can you actually channel that into something that is a publication that could be shared uh, open access? So, um, yeah, a shift of mindset, I would say. Um, and, and starting small and scaling slowly so that you get it on what, thing, how, what things are costing. And then you can bring in money specifically if you, if you want to uh, change something in your collections, database, etc. cetera. And, and again, like you said, Larissa, uh, network with colleagues in the museum sector because someone might have done what you are looking to do and then you might save money on that as well. You don't have to invent the, the wheel. That's a great, great uh, reflection there. I would also add, as I, as I said before, that it's about budgeting and prioritization. So first is the level of your commitment to the mission. If you think that open access is your mission of your organization, that's a mission level commitment. But once you've made that commitment, then you have to figure out how you're going to pay for it. And that comes in multiple levels. So I tend to favor, as Kasha does, an, or, an operational method as opposed to a project or grant-based method of doing digitization and open access. So that comes from your board or your government giving you funds for operations. Uh, giving you funds and support for servers, for databases, for software, which may not be uh, overly appealing in terms of publicity, but it's actually essential. Without the infrastructure, you really can't move forward to do the projects and to do the exhibitions and the content and the relationships with communities that your board and that your leadership wants. So without the infrastructure, you're not going to be able to do that. I think another thing, too, is to disambiguate in terms of the licensing and the request process, this issue of usage, as I mentioned, with usage fees and charging for services that have costs like labor and time and, tech and technology. So it's a, a providing a service. If it's a service that comes at a cost, the cost has to be paid for by someone. And if it's not going to be paid by government, it may have to be paid by the requester as a service, just as you would for any other service that you have in your life or good that you purchase. So it's being, I think, to, to say it bluntly, it's being real about the money and acknowledging that and working through those issues as you're going through your organizational change and making sure that you're matching open access priorities to your budget line and being and being focused on those intentions. Thank you very much, you two. Um, I now have the really difficult quest, uh, task to actually uh, wrap this series and this session up. Um, I think what we talked about today was um, was really important because you um, mentioned that it's all about priorities. 
and um, open glam has to become actually um, a priority within the sector and within the institution um, and uh, to actually become sustainable. It's not a project, not something that we do for some time. Um, we have to work we have to continue working on our data, both on the quality level and the accessibility level. It's not a travel that has a, has a beginning and end point, but it's um, an ongoing um, task um, that will is going to become even more present in the future. Um, I hope, at least. Thank you very much, you two, for wrapping this series up with me. As I said in the beginning of this session, um, this is not the end of Open Glam Now. Um, we are going to provide you all uh, with more sources um, and resources um, of information, um, how you can um, get the work done, how to begin, as <laughs> Neil said. Um, and um, I thank uh, you, the participants, very much, and of course, also you, the speakers, um, for taking part today. So um, thank you very much. Bye bye.